It is party time. Welcome to another episode, Monday episode of the Chad Prather Show. We're in Studio 22. We're in the mothership. We're uploading all the insanity straight to you. And uh, do you have the camera over there? Did y'all ever get a camera back? Can we see everybody? Look at the party going on at the motherboard of the mothership. Kayla, George, wave, George. Y'all are going to be seeing a lot more George. <laughs> a whole lot more George. <laughs> Summer of George. The uh, and of course, Super Chris Cruz. Let's love Brandon. You boys, uh, you boys and girl, did y'all have a good weekend? Everything good? Everybody lovely, cool? Lovely, lovely weekend. I I had a great show in Fort Smith, Arkansas, Friday night. Then uh, rolled down to Austin. Let me talk about Austin, Texas, for a minute. I avoid it like the plague, dude. You want to talk about a place that is just demonic? I mean, bro, it's become L.A. It really has. You have these really, really pretty people. And they're just stepping over zombies in the street. I mean, people just laying around. I mean, I've always known about the homelessness and the transient community in Austin, of course. But it's like worse than ever. I mean, everybody's cranked out of their mind. It's just insane. And they they just walk around like that's normal. I mean, it's just absolutely oppressive. But I had to go down there for a meeting. And I was down there with, you know, some thinkers and some talented people that think for a living and, and so we were down there for the minds meeting i was down there with an event with my partners over at based records and it was cool but uh cool event and uh I, but i couldn't wait to get out of that town i just could not wait so i got up i had to stay till this morning i was there till early this morning drove out of there but the funny thing about it was i was i was staying at the tommy the thompson hotel uh, downtown and um it's a pretty nice spot and i was on the 12th floor and I come out of my room yesterday, and I'm walking towards the elevator down the hall. I hear somebody else come out behind me. I look back. I see that there's a man behind me. Don't really pay attention to who, but I always like it. Well, somebody's behind me. I like to know it, right? So I go down to the elevator, and I'm not really paying attention, but I hear this guy stand behind me, and I hear this big groan, this ugh, like that. And I realize I'm wearing my buddy Todd Rosen. He's got a apparel brand called Chad's with two A's, chads.com. And it's very patriotic stuff. It's really cool. I'm wearing this shirt that says America, born and raised, with a big pickup truck on the back, you know. And I hear the groan. Ugh. I get on the uh, elevator, and, and I say, uh, you going down to one? Yeah, I'm going to one. Like that, real loud. And I look out of the corner of my eye, and it's the late show Seth Myers. And so, um, who is, you know, a liberal hack. But anyway. So I could just hear him breathing in the elevator, right? And finally I go, dude, why do y'all hate America so much? Like, why are you so triggered? He goes, I don't hate America. And I said, well, you, you, I, I could really tell by your visceral reaction. By the time the doors open on the first floor, he rolls his eyes and just marches out of there. And I'm like, these guys are a bunch of putzes. I mean, they really are. And I don't, you know, whatever. I, you know, I hate to have a brush in with somebody that's famous and, I, you know, Alex Stein went nuts when I told him that story. He's like, oh, my God, you didn't tell I could have been there. I stayed in the same hotel the night before. I wanted to troll him. Oh, my God. But I have class, and Alex doesn't. So um, there you go. That, was, that happened yesterday. But anyway, Austin, Texas, weird place. Avoid it like the plague. Absolutely insane down there. Um, but it was a good weekend overall. So I'm glad to be back in here. Let's get some stuff off our chest. I'm doubling down on the whole trans thing and Bud Light and everything else. And people keep saying, I'm going to reiterate one more time. You know, people keep saying, well, why are you offended by a beer can? I'm not offended by a beer can at all. Uh, but again, the issue is not about a beer can. You see what's happening with Bud Light. We'll talk about more of this later on. If you don't stand up to these companies, and I mean the top of the companies, because it's unfortunate that, you know, Anheuser-Busch probably employs about, what, 18,000 people? I don't know. It's a huge number, right? It's not those people's fault that Budweiser's deciding to do a woke campaign in the face of Nashville shooting tragedy carried out by a trans terrorist, and then to double down right there the same week of the shooting and, and say, we're going to come out and celebrate womanhood with somebody like Dylan Mulvaney, who pretends to be a 12-year-old girl, sometimes a six-year-old girl. And by the way, Dylan Mulvaney's never claimed to be a woman. He's always just a girl. Like, he's just discovering, you know, what it is to be emotional and what tampons do, and, you know, he cries all the time and uh, uh, whatever. And then talks about that, like, oh, see, I've, and I've changed my mind th three times today. Isn't that right, girls? So they, they, the fact that they're going to celebrate Dylan Mulvaney as somebody to be um, representative of womanhood, well, that pisses me off. I think it takes, as 
with bi- biological males competing in sports against women, it takes away their role, it takes away their honor, it takes away their dignity. And Bud Light doubled down on that. And I hate the fact that when we go after these companies, and by the way, you can go to 76forever.com and buy my brand new Bud Sucks shirt. Uh, it's beautiful. It's a beautiful shirt. Um, and I get it because people reach out to me and say, hey, you know, I've got a family member that works for Anheuser-Busch. This is not their fault. Which my response there is Anheuser-Busch is going to be okay. They're going to be fine. And, and your, you know, family member or friend is still going to have their job. I'm quite certain of that. But uh, the issue is not only, and don't forget, there's not only people that work for Anheuser-Busch. Think about the 30,000, 40,000 people that are distributors for Anheuser-Busch. There's a lot of people employed because of this, and they decided to embrace a woke agenda. Now, people say, why does this matter to you? Well, it matters to me because if we don't stand up against big corporations, then the little companies have no chance whatsoever in the face of the woke mob. Because what you saw happen with Anheuser-Busch was, was simply this. You have, you have, uh, and by the way, Anheuser Busch is a partner with the World Economic Forum. Just so you know, they are a partner. They are a member with the WEF. All right. So as long as the WEF and Vanguard and BlackRock and all of these major money people are out there backing these corporations and wanting them to boost their ESG scores, the envir- environmental, social, government governance, your social credit score. So they've got to push the woke agenda. They got to push the transgender agenda. They've got to push the LGB thing even further than they do. And as I've said before, I know that every major company has a LGBTQ plus 2A, what the hell ever alphabet you include, they have that marketing strategy in place. That's not the issue. And it hasn't been the issue. What Anheuser-Busch did was completely different than any of that. So as long as we have those companies pushing the, or, or these big organizations behind them, like the World Economic Forum, pushing them to boost their ESG scores, you're going to see more of the bullshit crammed down your throat, politicized, weaponized, and laundered and pandered out to the public. And uh, yeah, I, I'm going to stand against that kind of stuff. Because again, it, you, you worry about your person, that's a, your family member that's employed by Anheuser-Busch. The little company, the mom and pop shops out there, they ain't going to make it. They are not going to make it. Uh, because they'll, there's no way they'll be able to handle the, the economic pressure that these big things are going to put on them once they come for them. And let me tell you something. This, uh, this whole transgender community, it's, it's very bold for anybody to speak out about any of this stuff. And I'll pat myself on the back in regards to that because they're a very powerful community right now. All, they got all the financial backing. Uh, they're very, I mean, they're, da- they're downright militant, if you want to know the truth. And so they're going to continue to push this stuff. And when they decide to come after you, you're in trouble. Again, when it looks, as far as the cultural landscape of things, you're going to be in trouble. They're going to come after you. And trust me when I tell you, they're coming after all of us. Because it's not about equality, it's about control. And they will not stop until they get it. Anyway, more about that later on. Um, I don't know if you guys saw all the, uh, the violence going on with the youth in Chicago. Um, and I mean, I've seen some crazy videos of white, a white lady getting beat up by a black mob outside of her residence there, which I mean, you look at that and you say, well, <laughs> she probably voted for that bullshit. Um, and, you know, again, I don't know if you guys realize this or not, as we've been saying for years, I don't care how progressive you are, how left you are, how open minded you are, how woke you may be, how accepting and diverse and inclusive you may be. But when you continue to empower certain elements of society because you have bad politics and you're pushing bad narratives and agendas, guess what? You're going to get chewed up and spit out, too, because that, those wheels are going to grind you up, too, because eventually you want to play, play race politics. You want to play you know, socioeconomic politics. You want to do that. And you want to separate people by skin color and classes. Then guess what's going to happen? Eventually, that system that you set up, it's going to chew you up, too. And we're seeing that. We're starting to see it in Chicago. We're seeing this culmination. By the way, people in Chicago can't defend themselves. There's no, you can't have a gun in Chicago, so they can't defend themselves. They're not able to defend themselves because, again, they're law-abiding citizens. But what happens is when you restrict the law-abiding citizen, lawlessness takes over. 
right? The, the, the bad guys come for you and you are easy victim. You're a prey to, to their mob and it becomes a mob rule. So we're going to watch and see what happens in Chicago. But I think we're getting to that point where you're going to start seeing more and more of this played out because there's no repercussions. There's no consequences for their actions. And it's going to happen in Chicago. It's going to happen in Austin. I, I Listen, I was walking down 6th Street in Austin the other night. Our event uh, Saturday night went late. I had to, I had to, finally, I was like, I'm out. Like 1 o'clock in the morning, I walked back to the hotel. And, you know, me, I'm the dude that just kind of walks where angels, you know, fear to tread. I don't really care. I grabbed a slice of pizza from a food truck, and I'm just standing in the middle of 6th Street at 1 o'clock in the morning watching the nightmare that is 6th Street at 1 o'clock in the morning. In Austin, I mean, there are gangs of cops and police officers just standing around waiting for the riots to break out. I mean, recently there's been videos of violence and fights breaking out and just, you know, throngs of people beating the shit out of each other. And you have these cops and I mean, they're just positioned all over 6th Street. You're going to see it in every major city in America. That's why for me, I'm just I'm kind of done with the cities. I, I'm done with going into these big cities. I don't care where it is, even even in Texas. Because we don't have red cities in Texas anymore. Everything is everything is blue. And you see the policies of what is enacted by Democratic leadership in big cities all across America. And again, as Glenn Beck pointed out uh, in, um, in uh, uh, our overtime, which was a week ago, our overtime, which if you're not subscribed to blazetv.com and you're missing out on the Chad Prather Show overtimes that come out every Friday, you're missing out on some really good conversations. Glenn and I were talking about it, and, and he reminded everybody, you know, let's say the power grid goes down or an EMP goes off, which is it, it's, it's a matter of when something like that happens. Um, and suddenly it's going to take about, I don't know, 72 hours before they realize, the bad guys realize that nobody can come help you. Law enforcement's not coming because you don't have a way to call them. You don't have a way to alert them. And, and they're being overrun by all of the nonsense that's going on in a chaotic world now that we've been thrust into darkness. And uh, it's going to take about 72 hours for the bad guys to realize nobody's coming for you. And guess what? Then they're coming for you. Now, we've disarmed society. They want to push even more of that and say, well... You know, you shouldn't have a, quote, assault rifle. You shouldn't have, you know, firearms. You shouldn't have high-capacity magazines. The Second Amendment was written for muskets and not for AR-15s. They want you disarmed. They want you impotent. They want you weak. Uh, they want you unprotected. They want you unprepared because they know that, that eventually we'll just off each other in the grand scheme of things. Um, you know, if our, if our foreign enemies of Russia, of China, of Iran, anybody out there were to detonate EMPs off the west or, west or eastern seaboard and put the power out in the U.S., we'd kill each other in a matter of six weeks. They would never have to put a boot on the ground, folks. And we're seeing this already played out, this element of violence in our big cities where people are angry, people are frustrated, people are confused. Um, and we're over here playing woke politics with Anheuser-Busch while the world is absolutely going to shit in our cities. People are hurting each other, killing each other, beating each other up and, you know, smash, grab, steal, do whatever you want to do. There's no consequences. And I promise you, when that house of cards falls, I don't care who you voted for or who you support. I'm telling you, those wheels are going to grind you up just as quick as anybody else. All right. You want to be prepared. We, we got a new partner here, and uh, I just got one of these in the mail the other day. It's really, really cool. It's uh, called the Ghost Sleeve from Refuge Privacy, the Ghost Sleeve. Now, um, you know that cell phone that you've always got on your person, and I mean always with you. Um, it's useful in a lot of ways. It's also a portable tracking device that you're carrying around with yourself at all times. So if you're concerned at all, about big tech's invasive data tracking capabilities, or if you have security concerns like a stalker or you're concerned with things like EMPs that we're talking about, it'd be nice to be able to protect that phone with something that keeps everything and everybody out whenever you don't want them in there. Now, the ghost sleeve from Refuge Privacy does exactly that. It's made with a Faraday pre uh, fabric that blocks the signals to and from the phone and has sound blocking panels on each side. Uh, it's also made in America with American buffalo leather, so it's cool. It looks great. Uh, and each sleeve has a sealing mechanism, and the Faraday fabric has two layers, so it'll block out even the high-frequency 5G signals. Now, it's going to give you peace of mind. 
and it might even save your life. So I want you to check it out today. Uh, it's pretty cool little, pretty cool little um, accessory. Visit refugeprivacy.com today. That's refugeprivacy.com, and we'll be right back. Morgan Freeman. Morgan Freeman. I don't do a good Morgan Freeman. Uh, Morgan Freeman, I, I've seen this clip. You've probably seen this clip, too. Um, we've got the clip of it. I want to play it. This goes all the way back to 2005. Uh, this is when they, he was asked about Black History Month, and I don't think they were ready for his response. Play the clip. Black History Month you find ridiculous. Why? Ridiculous. You're going to relegate my history to a month? Oh, come well, on. What do you do with yours? What, which month is white history month? No, well, no, 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 come on. Tell me. Well, the, I'm Jewish. Okay. Which I'm, month is Jewish history month? Uh, there isn't one. Oh. Oh. Why not? Yeah. Do you want one? No, no. No. I, 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 I don't either. I don't want a black history month. Black history is American history. How are we going to get rid of racism? And stop still... talking about it. I'm going to stop calling you a white man. Yeah. And I'm going to ask you to stop calling me a black man. I know you as Mike Wallace. You know me as Morgan Freeman. You're... Mm. Stop talking about it. I mean, it's some common sense. Now, I, again, I talked about what I talked about in Chicago a minute ago where, you know, again, you have throngs of black youth that are, you know, just destroying the streets, attacking people and everything else. And, and people say, well, that's not racism. That's just hate. No, it's, it's still racism. I mean, it's, it's a very targeted deal. Um, stop talking about it. I mean, I thought racism was over when Obama got elected. I thought he was going to fix all of that thing. I mean, suffice it to say that Barack Obama set us back 70 years in race relations in America. But um, and not to mention make you hate law enforcement and everything else, uh, make you hate the country makes you hate patriotism it made people like seth myers groan and grunt and sigh on an elevator because he saw red white and blue on a white t-shirt um stop talking about it i mean I, I thought racism was over whenever uh colin kaepernick knelt knelt down i thought it was over when the football stadium started putting end racism on the back of the end zone uh i, I thought we were done with all of this kind of stuff but apparently not um we're still talking about it we're not doing what Morgan said do. So here's a clip. Here's another flashback from 2014, Morgan Freeman. Play that clip. Do you think that race plays a part in wealth dis distribution or either a mindset that you can't Today? or cannot? Yeah. No. You don't? No. I don't. I don't. I, you and I, we're proof. Why would race have anything to do with it? Stick your, put your mind to what you want to do and go for that. Uh, it's kind of like religion to me. It's a good excuse for not getting there. Yeah. You know, I said, and it's probably getting me in trouble, but I said to some of my colleagues recently, say, and so I know that it's an issue, but I've been, it seems like every single day on television I'm talking about race and it's because of the news cycle, it's in the news, but I'm so, sometimes I get so tired of talking about it, I want to I wanna just go, this is over, can we move on? And, and, and if you talk about it, it exists. Right. Yeah. It's not like it exists and we refuse to talk about it. But making it a bigger issue than it needs to be is the problem we have. Mm. Still talking about it. And I mean, that was, 2000, that was 2014. And yet we're still talking about it. Again, that was, that was prior to Donald Trump being president of the United States. Uh, and yet we're still talking about it. I mean, it, it's constant. Uh, <laughs> when Joe Biden, who is the president of the United States, uh, it was the nominee for the Democrat Party, he said, we're going to pick a woman of color that that was the only qualifications that he came up with for uh determining who is going to be the vice president of the united states it's going to be a female a woman of color uh which I, I again i don't understand if you can't define what a female is or what a woman is these days i don't know how you can define what color is anymore I, everything is all subjective right none of that should make any sense but uh this is the clown world we're living in this is what I mean when we're, we're confused. We can't stop talking about it because we love to stir the hate pot. We love to stir the crap up. And, and, and I don't know, man. I, I just don't think that by and large most, peop most people in America 
Uh, you just can't convince me that what's happening in the cities and, and things like that that I see that are just oppressive and truly demonic. And, you, it, and by the way, racism is demonic. If you've got a theistic worldview at all, if you believe in God, if you believe in a, in a creator, a designer, then you have to, by very nature of that confession, confess that there's, we're living in a spiritual world. And there are good spirits of light and there are evil spirits of dark. And those evil spirits of dark love to perpetuate things like hate and racism and violence and murder and you know animosity and man's inhumanity to man and that's the world we're living in but again will we ever stop talking about it well no because we still have people who make a lot of money off of it i mean my god these stories are coming out almost weekly if not monthly um about the blm people who you know either paid somebody, funneled money to a family member or a husband or bought mansions or all these things. I mean, there's big business in racism, right? There's big business. There's a lot of money in hate. And they, you think, you think that people like me or people that are, you know, of conservative mindset, you think that people like us are the ones who are stirring it up. I, I, I don't know about you, but I've never, I haven't made a dime off of racism. But the Al Sharptons and the Jesse Jacksons have, the Barack Obamas have, the Michelle Obamas have. I mean, my Lord, they've, they've, they're, they're worth, what, $130, 140000000 million since taking the presidency? Um, that, that's, <laughs> there's some money somewhere coming in there. I mean, I think they've proliferated, quite honestly, off their skin color um, and, and continuing to perpetuate race-hate relations. Um, here we are. Stop talking about it. Stop talking about it. But we, we can't, can't we? Just like this, you know, just like um, all the other crap that's being bombarded and occupying our time. I mean, you know, they might push a button and nuke all of us here in the next three weeks. We don't know, but we're going to be worried about uh, the wrong things when it happens. I can tell you that. Uh, that was a pretty good interview between uh, Elon Musk and, and Tucker Carlson. There's so many things on a Monday to try to get caught up with. Did you get to watch all of that, Chris? You, that, that's tonight, right? That was just a sneak peek. So it hasn't happened yet. Because I saw the clip, and I was like, I want to watch that. Uh, but again, I'm on the road all the time, so I never know if it's already happened or it's about to happen or whatever. Well, you, we've got that clip, don't we? Uh, let's, let's, let's play a little bit of that sneak peek. The degree to which uh, various government agencies had effectively had full access to everything that was going on on Twitter uh, blew my mind. Um, I was not aware of that. Would that include people's DMs? Uh, yes. Wow. Um, did they launch that rocket today, by the way? Oh, no, they I think they, they delayed it, right? Yeah, yeah, I, knew, I think something yeah. he's, I saw his tweet, something had frozen up on that deal. And, um, I mean, that ought to piss you off right there. You won't talk about a, a Faraday sleeve for your phone. Yeah. Now, did, did people think the government wasn't constantly spying on you? <laughs> I feel well, like my generation's the one grew up knowing, like, of course they're spying on you. I was having a conversation with a good friend yesterday over coffee yesterday morning, and, and they, we were talking about that, how people are just like, of course we, you know, these, so many people out there just trust the government. Really? I mean, the, the fact that it's the government, you should never trust men that have power over you. I, ever. I mean, just ever. That's just not a good, good way to look at the world. But yeah, your direct messages on Twitter most likely were not as private and secure as the users were once led to believe. Um, I mean, that's that's what they're saying. They dug into your DMs. Um, <clears throat> that's why I think about that stuff. Y'all ever think about that? I think about the government spying on me all the time. <laughs> I mean, when I'm laying there naked in a hotel room. Oh, I talk to my TV and I'll be like, well, thank you, Jeff Bezos. I do need this... <laughs> obscure brand of product i i sit there and think about it all the time i'm like you know um you know they're I, listen if you've ever seen the snowden movie oh yeah if you've seen that you should like yeah, yeah. your phone it's the it's one of the greatest ruses they came up with yeah i the mean NSA makes, rules that's why i used to stick you know when i would use a laptop all the time it's got the camera up there. i just put a piece of i put a band-aid over the thing remember an era when we didn't know they could do that right yeah now we know they're doing it yeah and they don't want you Thinking about that or oh, no. have anything to do with it. <clears throat> I mean, where's Edward Snowden today? Right? I mean, they rotting they, with Julian Assange. With Julian Assange. <laughs> I mean, I mean, you want to talk about victims. I mean, these guys were absolutely victimized uh, by the government. And so, you know, they, you know, oh, and they, they want to villainize them. It's just like this uh, to share a kid. 
You know, I mean, this Teixeira kid, he's 21 years old. He comes out, you know, he wants to look cool in front of his buddies, and he starts showing what the government's doing and how we're funding a proxy war in Ukraine, and they're trying to make him out to be, you know, villain number one. Um, and he did the same thing that, uh, what's his name, Vindman did, but he didn't get whistleblower status. And everybody's going to be like, oh, well, he didn't apply for it in a certain way. It's not the same. And I'll be like, okay, whatever. You just, everybody, everybody's picking their corners in, in how they're going to, you know, believe all this stuff. But it's it's absolute BS on this whole thing. I, I you know, watch watching people over any news story that comes out. I mean, if your government is doing nefarious things that uh, that are not in your best interest, that's not that's like that's not when you just start choosing sides against each other. That's when you look at your government and say it's time to hold you guys accountable. And we do that together. It doesn't matter which side of the proverbial aisle we're on or what our political leanings are. It's like they're trying to screw all of us. I, you pay you if you're a Democrat and whatever, if you're a Republican, you all pay taxes to the same IRS. You're funding the same federal government. I don't know if you know, realize that or not. I mean, like you you may not like Nancy Pelosi, but you actually pay her salary. Um, you may be a conservative in San Francisco. You're still paying Nancy's salary. It, it, think about it. You're funding the government that is trying to destroy you. And yet we're going to stay at each other's throats. And again, as long as they perpetuate the hate, they get the ants together, you know, put the black ants in the jar with the red ants and they get along fine till you shake the jar up. And then the red ants and the black ants start killing each other. And Chad, yeah. do you believe that that Air National Guard airmen did that? Because well, I don't know if I, you saw, there was another Tennessee Air National Guardsman arrested because he went to a website and applied to be a hitman. I saw that. So, like, I'm a little confused here. Like, how's, what is the probability of two National, uh, National Guardsmen to be like, yeah, I don't know. It's, well, I mean, I know it's that it's fishy to me. Well, you know, you got a National Guardsman, like you said, that goes to a website, signs up to be a hitman. I mean, it's not like you're you're signing up for a membership at Costco. Yeah, and then the FBI is just sitting there waiting. Yeah, and gives you twenty five hundred. Well, you saw how fast they did it. Now they haven't done the you know Supreme Court leak. They haven't revealed the Epstein client list. Exactly. That's what I'm saying. Like, yeah, how is it possible that the FBI is so quick to find the kid? up there and then this kid in tennessee that quickly yeah i don't know yeah sounds fishy it's very suspicious they found it which tells me they can find anybody they want to find exactly immediately. immediately exactly uh i'm gonna live a long time you know why texas superfoods uh texas superfoods guys you know what you better be doing business with the people that you can trust people that share your values and the founder of texas superfoods is a veteran uh he's a texan He's a homeopathic doctor, and he's committed his life to help people who want to uh, get out of the American medical system and take your health into your own hands. So he developed Texas Superfoods, and Texas Superfoods is vine ripe and is antioxidant rich. They use raw natural fruits and vegetables to create these. And uh, we know during COVID, we learned how important it is for our immune system to be strong. And we learned there's a bunch of crap out there on the market that tries to fix symptoms to our health issues. And the simple truth is that our body, when properly fed, has an amazing ability to heal itself and ward off even fight disease. I'm taking Texas Superfoods every day. I feel great. I don't worry as much about my diet because I know that with Texas Superfoods, my body has what it needs to keep me going and functioning at my best. I want you to give them a try. Uh, and trust me when I tell you, it's good stuff. TexasSuperfoods.com. That's TexasSuperfoods.com. Give them a give them a shot, and uh, we'll be right back. <laughs> Doesn't matter when you count me in. I'm going to cough. I'm going to cough. I, I don't know something about being in this room. I, anyway, guys. If you've been listening to or watching this show for a while, you know that we have an opportunity to have a lot of fun around here. We bring up elements of the culture war and we take clever pot shots at them and we have a great time doing it. It pays the bills, quite honestly. And I think we can admit to ourselves that it lets off a little steam in the process. I love it. And uh, the other thing I find it necessary to do in my own meditation on these things in front of us 
and in front of you when I try to wax eloquent is to probe under the surface in search of root causes and one hopes in search of some kind of remedy to the mad chaos that that births them into our culture in the first place. So we've all been screaming at Budweiser, right, over their incredibly poor decision to make Dylan Mulvaney the spokesperson for Bud Light, even if it was just for a minute. Uh, they went from real men of genius to fake women of penis. We've made the memes and the videos and the music and the public outcry was such that the company released, well, they released this commercial to try to make up for it. Play the clip. Let me tell you a story about a beer rooted in the heart of America, found in a community where a handshake is a sure contract, brewed for those who found opportunity in challenge and hope in tomorrow. Raised by generations willing to sip Share, risk, remember. This is a story bigger than beer. This is the story of the American spirit. Mm. Anheuser Busch, uh, you know, I, I listen. <laughs> I mean, first of all, a handshake doesn't mean crap in St. Louis. <laughs> and it's, you know, it's also now what Belgian own. So it's not the American spirit. What you see there is an attempt on the part of Anheuser-Busch Company to return its audience to a state which they once inhabited. It wasn't so long ago that any Budweiser commercial would feature one of two advertising substrates and strategies. They had comedy or Americana. The latter was often wrapped in the folds of a type of patriotism. The comedy was hit or miss, and it spanned from, you know, the gamut from real men of genius to talking frogs with a little dash of that, you know, adult male humor that we recognize today as what the left would label toxic masculinity writ large across the set of the fantastic boobs that, you know, used to be on the Bud Light calendars and posters. But... Despite producing beer that we all know kind of sucks, it worked for them. And uh, then, <clears throat> then they had that moment that, you know, that every major corporation faces. Do we go woke and risk going broke? Uh, or they caved to it. And whether the people in their marketing department genuinely thought that this was a good idea or they simply bent over and grabbed their ankles at the behest of the increasingly vocal minority, it doesn't much matter. They went for it. And now they're quite deservedly getting their asses handed to them. Now, people out there want to disagree with that, but listen— their CEO, Brendan Whitworth, he had something to say about it because they are literally having their asses handed to him. And here's what he said. I want to read it to you. He said, as the CEO of a company founded in America's heartland more than 165 years ago, I'm responsible for ensuring every customer feels proud of the beer we brew. We're honored to be a part of the fabric of this country. Anheuser-Busch employs more than 18,000 people, and our independent distributors employ an additional 47,000 valued colleagues. We have thousands of partners, millions of fans, and a proud history supporting our communities, military, first responders, sports fans, and hardworking Americans everywhere. We never intended to be a part of a discussion that divides people. We are in the business of bringing people together over a beer. And he went on, but the key phrase there is we never intended to be a part of a discussion that divides people. And my answer to that, well, brother, too little too late. Because listen, we're not talking about some fly-by-night issue that occasional companies are making an oopsie by taking the wrong side on. We're talking about a critical, dangerous idealization and fetishization of a quote-unquote community of people comprised of two groups, the mentally ill and the mentally ill. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, the first group is people who, through no fault of their own, genuinely believe that they're in the wrong body. It goes by names like gender dysphoria and body dysmorphia, and it's an extremely rare but heartbreaking mental condition that you or I would not wish on anybody. Now, the far less rare group of mentally ill people inside this community are the people whose psychological and moral frameworks are so airsats and tattered that they barely exist. These are people just waiting for a fad to come along that somehow empowers them to feel better about themselves and adversarial towards others. Their emotional instability and insecurity is a thing ripe for the picking when leftist ideology comes along with its wicker basket in search of power. And by the way, let's invoke the wise and souls of Kamala Harris, the soul of Kamala Harris for a minute, because let's face it, she's not using it, and create a little Venn diagram of the mind for a moment. What other group of humans do you associate with emotional and psychological immaturity, instability, 
insecurity. What other group of humans is extraordinarily pliable in terms of the BS they will accept without question? What other group reigns in its susceptibility to pathological forms of mind control that disguise themselves like a wolf in sheep's clothing as ultimate freedom? The kind of freedom that is purchased at no cost whatsoever and is therefore as utopian and unreal as it's possible to imagine. Well, if you said children, then you win the unfortunate time to be alive, bingo. Listen up, Anheuser-Busch. You want to tip the scales of American favor back in your direction? You're going to have to do a hell of a lot more than masturbate the American public with a Clydesdale and an American flag waving in the breeze. You, like all the rest of us who genuinely care about this issue, need to change. Be the change in the world that matters. Don't bow down to the woke mob. Don't do their advertising for them. Don't feed into this increasingly complex machine that threatens to roll over our society and crush it flat. And remember, I don't even mean the trans movement when I say that. That's just the symptom of a bigger sickness. So swing the pendulum, Bud Light, until it flies far away from the desperately awful place you're sending it and back to a more rational and good place. Oh, or... Here's a thought. Maybe don't get involved with the culture wars at all and just focus on making a beer that's worth freaking drinking. I had somebody on social media the other day who's a friend of mine who uh, tends to get a little triggered with the uh, things I say from time to time on social media. And she said uh, she used to be a manager of a, of a bar that we play music at music venue and she said well I've, I've served you a bud light or time or two and i was like probably more than a time or two i've drank a lot of bud lights in my life i mean if i'm gonna drink a domestic beer the simple choice for me has always just been give me a bud light um it's it's the closest thing to water and uh, i'm not a huge beer drinker but um once they decide to exploit women and to draw upon the fetishization of a guy who is playing a little girl uh, and who's a 28-year-old man who doesn't know anything about being a 12-year-old girl, then I decided that Bud Light sucks, okay? And that's my choice. I have my right to do that. And I just absolutely love the fact. I, and by the way, as I said last week, I'm not called for a boycott. I don't give a crap if you drink the stuff. But it is, it is fascinating to me to watch this happen because I went into, I stopped in a gas station somewhere around Temple, Texas the other day on my way down to Austin, and I turn around and here comes Alex Stein walking in the gas station random gas station alex stein's walking in looking like crap because he does and uh and and i was standing over there by the beer cooler one of those walk-in deals that's kind of the room and again once again i saw it man bud light stacked to the ceiling in the beer cooler and all the other beers picked over so hey i you know will they be okay sure they will be sure they will be it's not about putting somebody on a beer can. It's not about a marketing campaign. It's way deeper than that. And it, you better be glad that there's people with a platform like myself who are willing to speak up to this because I promise you they've already destroyed masculinity. Culture has destroyed masculinity. Everything's about the beta male. Everything is about masculinity being toxic. Now they're coming after the fem feminine. They're coming after the female. They're coming after the real woman, the biological woman. You know, we've got realwomensclub.com. You can go there. We've got the, you know, real women don't have balls. Real women aren't men. People love to comment on our social media posts and say, well, trans women are real women. And I was like, well, they can't get a pap smear oh is that how you define a real woman no i'm just using it as an example like if an emt shows up at your car wreck and you're a dude wearing a wig guess what they're going to treat you like a guy if you're injured it just a simple fact they're going to treat you like a guy because biologically you are one and there are certain defining factors that oh yeah well not all cis women can have a pap smear yeah but they got the equipment to do it at some point in time in their life, they've at least had the biological equipment to do it. So quit with your justification because you've exposed yourself of living in a fantasy land versus reality. And they are coming after real women. They're coming after real women. They want to destroy it all. Just like that dude who's now taken down his deal. You can see it on my Instagram at Watch Chad. The dude who talks about God being trans and we're 70% water and so we're all fluid and we can just change however we want to change. That guy's now taking that video down because you know what? It was asinine and ignorant. And uh, anyway, anyway, that's the deal. They, they, they want the entire world to be fluid and undefinable. 
And that, my friend, is something that you don't want because you don't want to live in a society where you can't define yourself and have an identity. You don't want to live in that society because that's when you get easily marginalized and you become like the Jews in 1938, 1939. That's what you become like in Nazi Germany. Because again, your identity has been taken away from you. They can label you. They can do what they want to with you, even to the point of extermination. So yeah, we're going to fight this fight. All right, guys, everybody deals with pain from time to time. I am in love with Relief Factor. I'm in love with it. Absolutely. You need to get it. Um, I'm telling you, I, I, I was skeptical of Relief Factor. I really was. I, I, you know, I didn't want to add. I take a lot of supplements. So I was like, I don't, do I want to add four more pills to what I'm doing every, every day? But man, with the inflammation that I get in my elbows and my ankles, you guys have heard me bark about it all the time. It comes back day after day, and relief factors made a huge difference. And um, you do not want to live in pain. It steals your life. It steals your joy. It steals your ambition to go do things actively, and you need to get rid of that stuff. It's awful. So the good news is it doesn't have to be where you live in pain. Relief factor is a great way to reduce pain, and it's mostly caused by the inflammation, and they're actually doing studies that are saying if you can reduce inflammation, you actually live longer. So if you take Relief Factor as directed, I believe it can absolutely change your life like it did mine. It's not a drug, but it's developed by doctors, reduces the inflammation in your body. People who take it tend to take it again, and they keep on ordering it because they find that it works. So if you're living with pain, I want you to try the three-week quick start, $19.95. It's a trial pack. Go to relieffactor.com. Get the trial pack, and I guarantee you, I just, I really believe you're going to love it if you'll take it. Relieffactor.com or give them a call, 800, the number four, Relief. We'll be right back. So I pull up and, you know, I'm, during the break, I look at Instagram and boom, there's a video of Jeffrey Marsh and Dylan Mulvaney. I mean, we're just being bombarded with this stuff. And they're talking about lessons they've learned about girlhood, not womanhood, girlhood. And, um, you know, in a, in a world of people like that, be a Riley Gaines, you know, um, I, Riley Gaines is, is, she's a tough one. She's a warrior and she's, she's. We know she's got a competitive spirit because of her success in collegiate swimming, but she's, she's taking that attitude to this culture war as well, fighting back for real women. I got to say, I'm, I'm appreciative. Uh, speaking of that, James O'Keefe had a little confrontation with Dylan. <laughs> Did you see that? Oh, we got the clip. Play the clip. Dylan, this is James O'Keefe, OMG. Women are being raped in a prison in Washington State by men claiming to be transgender. There's footage of them talking about the rape. Do you have a comment on the story here uh, of the w women being raped by the men claiming to be transgender? <laughs> James O'Keefe, OMG News. Um, do you, what do you think about the women who are being raped by the men who are transgender? Do you have a comment about that? Please don't come in the elevator. Oh, sorry. Um, what do you think about, what is your comment to the women who are being raped by men claiming to be transgender, Dylan? So we're here with Dylan uh, here. Uh, haven't had much Bud Light recently, but we're very interested in the women's prison. Dylan? Go. Oh. For those of you who are listening and could not see the video, trust me, I want to tell you, Dylan was shook. <laughs> what? Where, where does he live? That seemed like an awful nice place. Yeah, I'm thinking that's a hotel. Uh, that's, uh, and I, I, just from the look of it, that looked like a hotel. It and, looked like um, it was made of gold. Yeah. So kind of looks like where Seth Myers and I were yesterday. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I don't know how James O'Keefe finds these people the way he does, but he does. And I've seen James in action and trust me, um, he's incessant. I would have to punch him in the mouth. I was kind of hoping Dylan was going to, you know, boy up a little bit. That would have been fun to be that honest. That would have been fun. I still yeah. confess. I still think that eventually a picture is going to come out of Dylan being a guy again. Uh, hanging out at a bar with a bunch of other guys because because he's not transgender. I've said this over and over again. He's not transgender, and I know you guys are sick of me talking about it. But uh, tough. I, I we, we got you got to expose this stuff. I mean, as James was saying, you got women being raped in a women's prison by biological males who are claiming to be women, and and is happening over and over again. This is epidemic at this point. 
um, sports society. And, and, and what's amazing to me is how these so-called feminists are absolutely silent about it. Play the clip with uh, Katie Porter and Pierce Morgan on Bill Maher's show. Play that clip. You should it. be able to have a civil debate. Nobody, including Riley Gaines, who I disagree with strongly, should be Jeez, should what physically. What do you disagree with out of interest? Um, I, I think that it should be up to sporting bodies to make the decisions about who but and how she should What has she said compete. that's actually wrong? I think that what she has done is try to turn this. We talked about people you know, becoming, using things to kind of get likes and get clicks. That's not what she's doing. <laughs> I mean, I, I've got no truck for right against Gaines personally, but all I've seen her do is stand up for women's rights to fairness and equality. Well, she, okay, has so she, she actually competed oh. against Leah Thomas, and it was obviously unfair. Leah Thomas won one of the races in the NCAA championships by 50 seconds against a bunch of biological females who simply couldn't keep up. That cannot be right. It and cannot be fair. That is something <laughs> that I trust I think our sporting bodies should be dealing with. And by the way, Riley is speaking up for herself, and that is her prerogative, and I respect her free speech. I think she's speaking up for but pretty much every female athlete in the world. I there you go. That right there is a female getting dominated by a bio biological male. I mean, Pierce Morgan just dominated her in debate right there. Just put her abs Go make a sandwich, Katie Porter. Really. Cause, yeah, cause, I mean, that's what we got to say to him at this point, right? Like, it's beyond conversation. It's like, shut up. Yeah, just shut up. You're, you are an ignoramus. There's no justification for what you said. I'm proud of my man Steve Dace. Uh, his movie came out Friday, Nefarious. Uh, and, uh, you know, those folks, the same folks that make God's Not Dead and Unplanned, which were decent movies. But Nefarious is next level. Um, it was ranked, I think it's in like the, like the top six movies in the nation. And uh, that's it's on like 60% less movie theaters and screens across the country, and it's still killing it. Uh, you've seen the trailer for it. You say, oh, my God, I don't want to go watch a horror film. It's not scary. It's not. It's, it's based on a book by Steve Dace, uh, The Nefarious Plot. It's sort of like an updated version of C.S. Lewis's The Screwtape Letters and uh you know kind of an interview with a demon and it's a psychiatrist that goes to the prison to meet with a convicted killer who's about to be executed killer says he's a demon named nefarious psychiatrist doesn't believe in god or demons he's got to decide if the man's insane or pretending to be insane um uh, and i'm not gonna give away any of the plot but i'm telling you it's intense it's good it's gonna make you think it's gonna make you talk it's gonna make you believe and see some things and it's a great conversation starter um and uh it's even got glenn beck in it they didn't ask me but anyway uh it's it's open nationwide so i want you to go to uh who is nefarious.com that's who is nefarious.com go see that movie we'll be right back Hey, Wednesday night, uh, I'm going to be uh, Real Life Real Music with Kyle Hutton at do, do there in the Woodlands. Come check it out. Uh, it's going to be a cool little radio show in front of a live audience. You can find information at chadpratherlive.com, and then I'm going to be at 2920 Roadhouse with the band, uh, Stephen, Stephen Ben at least, and uh, we're going to be at uh, 2920 Roadhouse there in Hockley, Texas. Cool show's coming up in June with my buddy Zach Rushing, both in Biloxi and in uh, Beaumont. Check them out. We're going to have some fun. We love you. God bless you, and we will see you tomorrow. Bye. Thank you.